The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome everyone. My name is Aubrey McLaughlin, and I am the Director of Alumni Professional Networks for the University of Maryland Alumni Association. We're excited that you're able to join us for today's webinar, Intro to Agile for Real World Business, presented by Cynthia Kahn, Smith School Bachelor's and MBA graduate from the class of 1981 and 1985, and Jerry Slama Grove, Smith School MBA graduate from 1985. This webinar is part of the Alumni Association's Professional Development Webinar Series, in which we hope to provide thought-provoking and valuable content that will help alumni like you achieve your personal and professional goals. We have a lot of information to cover today, but we will be taking questions throughout the duration of the webinar. Feel free to submit any questions using the question box located in the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will take them as they are submitted. Cynthia and Jerry met while earning their MBA at the Smith School of Business. Both women have over 20 years of experience managing both agile and waterfall projects. In addition, both have earned their PMP and CSM. Cynthia is a co-author of the GSD Scrum Handbook and the co-founder of the agile consulting company GSD Mindset, where she teaches Scrum in one day and coaches teams as they transition to Agile, leaving their waterfall ways behind. Jerry joined GSD Mindset to bring the message to the East Coast. And now we will get started. Ladies, take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Cynthia Kahn. Hi, I'm Jerry. Hold on, I'm trying to get this thing to work. Okay, so. Thanks for coming today. A lot of people always ask us, what does GSD stand for? And it stands for getting stuff done. I think Aubrey gave a pretty good, very detailed example of our background, but we do want you to know that, I want you to know that I've been an Agile convert for over eight years. Both of us do have our PMP, so we have a perspective on both the Agile and the traditional, because when people want to change, we know what has to happen. And I personally worked on many Agile transitions, especially at big companies like Nike, Cambia, which is the regional Blue Cross in the Pacific Northwest, and at Intel. I'll tell you why we love Scrum. We love Scrum because the Agile mindset, rather than focused on making a big plan and checking off things on that plan and making sure that you're completing whatever you said you're completing, the Agile mindset's focused on delivery and process improvement. So when you change your focus from a Microsoft project plan to actually getting something done for your customer, it's a huge, huge shift. Also, the shift in ownership goes from the project manager being responsible for the project to the entire project team being responsible for getting everything done. And so that also improves teamwork. And basically, who doesn't like getting more stuff done better and faster? The reason why we started GSD Mindset is because, I don't know if any of you are PMPs, but as a PMP, you need to take a lot of developmental courses, you have to have a certain number of hours in order to renew. And so I attended, and I'm sure Jerry, you've attended, right? Oh, yes. A, a ton of classes and every single class that we went to taught about the theory, but none provided the practical application for real world business. So April Shepard, who is one of the co-founders and I, we were sitting in a, a training class, a very popular one, and we just knew that we could do better. So that's when we got the gsd.guru domain, we founded the company, we wrote the handbook, which is agile, so it's only like 40 pages, three to four pages on a topic. We created the Scrum in One Day workshop so that people could come in and in one day actually know how to apply Scrum. So that's a little bit about us. How about a little bit about you? So Aubrey's going to collect some information. She developed a little poll. Basically, we just kind of want to know if you think that you would classify yourself as a beginner, which is new to Agile, if you feel like you're kind of intermediate, you've been doing it for one to three years, or you're like me, 
you couldn't go back if you tried. Perfect. So the question is now up. If you would like to um, please submit your answer on the screen um, just by selecting one of the options. Um, we'll leave this open for about 20 more seconds here um, just to collect all the votes and then we'll be able to see the results. So do we wait? Yep, so I will, um, almost everyone, we've about 87% of those who are on the webinar who have voted already. So I am actually going to close this poll and share the results with you. So 100% of the people who participated are completely new um, and, and a beginner. So um, lots of opportunity to educate uh, the people that are on right now. Excellent. Good. Good, good, because I'm always afraid like people are going to go, duh. <laughs> <laughs> now, excellent, excellent. So we're going to cover quite a few topics in a short period of time. We're going to talk about the terms, what is Agile, what is the MVP or the minimum viable product, and we specialize in Scrum. What is Scrum? And how is Scrum different from the way that you're probably doing it today? What is a scrum team and who's on the scrum team. When you look up scrum on the scrum alliance or scrum.org or any of the other places that you would research, they talk about planning, but they don't actually tell you how to plan. So today I'm also going to give you a little planning lesson. If you tune in next week, we'll go into this in more detail. We're going to talk about how you sprint. So when people talk about sprinting, you kind of know what's going on. Another thing is, they tell you that you're supposed to sprint, but they don't tell you what you should be doing during your sprint. And we'll summarize with a little bit of the benefits of Scrum. So if you have any questions while we're on the topic, please enter it and Aubrey will let me know because I'm not gonna be paying attention to that. <laughs> I'm gonna be paying attention to the presentation. So a lot of people talk about Agile and like what is Agile? Well, Agile is a huge, huge, broad category. And Agile management itself just refers to the iterative incremental method of managing the design and building activities. And the interesting thing is they don't just limit it to software development. They think, well, engineering, information technology, and most importantly, business areas. If business areas organize themselves into scrum teams and became more agile, they could also get more stuff done. So, it aims to provide a new product or service development in a highly flexible and iterative manner. So it doesn't really describe anything about how that is. So when people have an agile mindset, they want to get things done in an incremental method that also aims to be highly flexible. Why is it that everybody's talking about agile and why do we need to change? Well, the complex projects and the quick paced projects that we do all seem to have high risk. So if we broke our projects down into the smaller features that we needed to deliver, we could deliver them more frequently. So we really need to figure out what it is that we need to deliver first that gives us the biggest bang for our buck to reduce risk. Requirements change is a fact of life. There's no longer the time where you can afford to sit around and, and spend six months getting all the requirements and prioritizing them and defining them because they're gonna change within that even six months. So we need the ability to deliver and pivot. We also need to get over the way that we're thinking now that we need to have everything defined before we can start building a solution. You're never going to have all the answers because those answers are going to shift out from under you. And when I was at Intel, they called that the need to shift left. Start doing things earlier in the timeline. We've also heard, and this really makes me sad, that businesses don't use most of what they ask for. So if you had a better priority, if you could break things down into features, you really need to know what the minimum viable product is. And once again, things are changing, so we need to operate at the speed of business. So what's the minimum viable product? We'll go through an example later, but in general, I think it's really important that the people who sort of coined the phrase of the minimum viable product, Frank Robinson, Steve Blank, Eric Rees, all those people from the 
the lean type books, the minimum viable product is really a learning vehicle. It allows you to test any idea by exposing an early version of it to your target market. You want to collect the relevant data and learn from it. A lot of times you'll see these visions of a circle. You go from idea to build to test to bringing the information back to building. And that's the whole iterative process. And why is this so important? Well, basically, you need to identify the feature set that has the most meaning to your customers because that just re reduces the cost of your version one. Customers also get the opportunity to use the product and provide feedback because how many of us who are in technology have built something that the customer exactly said to their specifications and after they see it, they're like, wow, that really wasn't what I thought or that really isn't what I wanted. So the sooner you know that and you can predict that, the better. Gathering insights from an MVP is definitely less expensive than developing a full-blown version of the product before you release it out into the wild. Providing the ability to pivot if the product fails is really important because our assumptions could be completely incorrect or what the customer wanted also may not be what they actually want, what they said they wanted. It reduces risk. So when you know the MVP, you know what to build first to figure out all this stuff. Think about it as applying the 80-20 rule to your project priority. And this brings us down to what's Scrum. So Scrum is an Agile method. So let's think of Agile as the big umbrella of approaches and iterative methodologies. Scrum is just one of them. Other things you'll hear about are Kanban, XP, Lean, all of those things are Agile, but they're not Scrum. Scrum as defined by the Scrum Alliance is a framework where you can address complex adaptive problems while productively and creatively delivering products of the highest possible value. Well, what does that mean? Not much, but adaptive is good. And I like that because it's also one of the three pillars. So when you're thinking about Scrum and Scrum theory, Scrum, which is a lot different than how a lot of people are forced to manage their projects today, it's focused on transparency. You always know where you stand. It focuses on inspection. You have to test every time you close a story or you before you even say something's finished. And adaptation, there's something that's called the retrospective, which we're going to talk about, that allows you to discuss and adapt at the end of every sprint. Some of you who, had, maybe if you had said you were doing it for one to three years, they, people say they're practicing Scrum, but if you're not actually doing a, a sprint planning where you're planning every two weeks or whatever your sprint is, if you're not standing up every day, if you don't have demos and you're not conducting a retrospective as part of the adaptation improvement process, you're not actually practicing Scrum. So it's really something to think about when people say that they're going to implement. You need to be practicing and thinking about all of these things before you can say that you're practicing Scrum. To draw that home a little bit, I think it's really important before we even get started into some of the details that we understand the difference between what a traditional project is and what an agile approach to that same project would be. Traditionally, when you're planning a project, you approach it like a layer cake. You complete it one layer at a time. First, you get all the requirements. Then you do some analysis and design. Then you put together a schedule and you start coding all of these things. And maybe there's some testing by the developers. But then after you figure it's like in a really good state, then you'll give it to your customer or your users and let them try it out. And then if they say it's the people who are testing it say it's okay, then you'll finally move it into production. Well, agile projects focus on completing little teeny tiny pieces of functionality. Every story, and we'll talk about stories, goes through that complete life cycle that we talked about that you used to do in an entire project. So think about doing everything at a micro level and delivering at the end of every sprint. When you look at, if you're a PMP, then you'll know about the work breakdown structure and you take all the work that needs to be done and you break it down into its task structure. 
Well, think about based your, if you're an agile, you'll think about, I need to deliver it. You'll figure out what the high level features are. You're going to break them down into deliverable components and you're going to prioritize your components. Everything is about delivery. It's not about tasks. Also in traditional project management, the project manager signs tasks from a plan. In agile projects, you have somebody called a product owner who's actually a representation of your customer. They're the one who writes their own requirements. They prioritize the backlog. And it's the project team itself, the developers, the business analysts, the QA people who actually commit to the work. So responsibility shifts. Project managers, there's some have to really become, if you're going to be a scrum master, need to learn about servant leadership or allowing people to make their own decisions. In traditional projects, status are, is based on completed tasks which oftentimes means that a task can be complete, but you haven't actually delivered anything. So status can go to like 70 or 80% complete. You have an OMG moment and things go back to like 40% because you have to redo something. That won't necessarily happen in an agile project because the status is based on closed stories, whatever you finished in your backlog versus the features that remain and are standing uncomplete in your backlog. Another difference is you're going to deliver features maybe on a quarterly basis, twice a year, whatever. In an agile project, at minimum, you should think about delivering features at every at the end of every sprint, which is usually two to four week increments. Does anybody have any questions about this particular point or some of the concepts here before we get into something? Because we don't really go back over these things. For now, I don't have any questions in the question box. Okay, so that's that. I must be super clear. <laughs> awesome. So a lot of people talk about their Scrum team. In Scrum theory, a t the optimum team size, and I think this is on any team, is like seven to nine members. So here's some of the people if that should be on a Scrum team because Scrum is should be organized. Your team should be organized so they can complete the work that they have chosen for themselves or that needs to get done without somebody else from another team having to do anything. So if your testers aren't on your scrum team, that's, for example, that's a really bad thing because then you are more likely to close stories without them being tested or leave stories untested. And that really messes with the whole thing about getting stuff done. That's just one example. So, you hear that term product owner. So what's the product owner? The product owner represents the customer. Notice it's not necessarily the product manager. It, sh it should be somebody from the business, but it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody from the business. But that person has to speak, have the license to speak for the business because they're the ones that translate requirements into stories. They're the ones that have to prioritize the backlog. They're the ones that are present at daily standups and demos and making the decisions and proving and approving stories is closed. A lot of times, if you get somebody from the business, they don't know any of these things. So if, if you're new to Scrum, having a business analyst or somebody on your team to support that person who's used to writing in the traditional method requirements, it really, really helps because those people are focused on that. They've already done the translation before, not maybe quite in the same way, but they can help. The Scrum Master is not a project manager because they are experts in Scrum and they're servant leaders and they let people make their own decisions. And a Scrum Master knows how to apply the rules of Scrum to get stuff done. It's their job to facilitate stand-ups, to formally like organize and facilitate sprint planning and to facilitate the retrospective. They decide when people wanna break the rules, whether that's allowed. And it's their job, just like when you're a project manager to remove roadblocks. And then everything else is dumped into what they call the development team. So there's the product owner, the scrum master and the development team. And the development team should be more than developers unless the product owner is going to test every story. They will accept the story, but they don't necessarily have to test it if you can get some kind of QA testers, things like that. So P 
people who have a QA department that should be divided up and QA testers should belong to the team because these people have to work together over and over, do retrospective and improve the way they work together. And it's really helpful if you can do that on a, st on a steady basis. The, the longer you can keep a team together, even if you add new people or one or two people about the better. And I, in this world, they don't necessarily have to be all located in the same location, which is what Scrum prescribes, but they do have to have a way to work together so that they become a true team. The one thing that they don't teach you is how to plan. So I'm going to give you an idea about what planning is like, because I think if you're going to learn how to be more agile, you're going to learn how to apply Scrum, you still need to plan. So what you do when you're planning is you plan for feature epic releases rather than just saying, we're going to do some stuff and we're going to release at the end of the month. You know what features you want to include in that release and you don't make up a Microsoft project plan. Here's how you do it. You identify whatever your high level epics, if you've done use case writing or the super high level use cases, you break them down into deliverable components, you figure out what your minimum viable product is, and you create a plan. Then you're ready to write stories and sprint. It's, people go, well, how do you write stories? I'm like, well, you have to plan. A lot of people don't plan. They just want to sit down and start writing little teeny tiny piece stories that represent a small slice of functionality. That doesn't always work if you don't know what you need to get done. So I think it's really important that we go through this planning process. So the first thing that we do is identify epics. And to, as an example, when we do our training, I like to use a banking application, an online banking or your mobile banking application as an example, because everybody knows what that is. And they've used it and they've seen how it's organized. So when you're looking at your banking application, what is it that you think when they were designing it, where the high level epics are sets of features that you can do. So this is where I guess you're going to write something into the chat, like what you, you can even quickly open your banking app and tell me what you think those epics were or the features when they decided. And I will translate those into, I'll just type them up so everybody can kind of see them all together. So everybody who is on the webinar, you'll see a chat uh, function that is on your toolbar. It's at the very bottom. Um, if you um, type your answers in that chat bar, I will uh, facilitate um, your responses. Uh, we have branch locator, Cynthia. Okay. Now you can see how well I can type. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on, guys. Uh, low funds warnings. Okay, that's yeah, pretty that's low. So let's like, we could do low funds warnings, but what do you think that's, that's probably part of a, so if you could. Um, we have check balances. That's, it might be like check balances. Maybe account, check balances. account overview. And that's probably the highest, like a higher one. So like, I would think like maybe account overview would be pretty, would be the higher epic. And then you would have, I'm going to display balances or warnings under that, but okay. We have account balances transactions. Okay, that's still part of check balances and transactions would be part of probably your account overview. Uh, we have mobile deposit. Okay, that's good. Uh, log in and log out. So I'm going to make that higher, like security. If, but wait, you get yeah, one more. Uh, settings and transfers. Okay. And that might be part of security as a higher thing and balance transfers. Okay. So you get the idea, but the important thing is is to try to group them as high as possible, so that and maybe if you maybe when you start 
break in the second the next part where you take the epics and break them down into deliverable components you'll you'll get kind of an idea here's the ones that we thought of which are very similar you're going to have definitely there's a customer account maintenance which is where you change you know do all that stuff there's the bank account maintenance which is kind of includes all the account balances and stuff bill pay being able to transfer money and also your your statements so you, you guys are getting on the right track but this would be the kind of exercise that you would think of and so then once you have your epics which would be kind of across the top if you did this together you can do it virtually using Visio or powerpoint but you want to then take those high level epics and then break them down into deliverable components which when we're looking at this one right here like if we you would realize like account overview would include components that include low funds warnings check balances and and a listing of your transactions and you would kind of figure out once you were starting to break it down that um, security includes account settings and some of those other things maybe so let's do that for one of our components so we talked about customer account maintenance and what do you think some of the components of customer account maintenance we're going to be so if you're going to build that what do you what do you think that is oops come back um so i have some answers coming in uh, address changes okay Pass Good. password changes Social security changes. A home branch. Oops, one more. And setting up bill pay. Well, bill pay, I think would be, I would have bill pay as, in the original thing that we did last, I would have that as a separate thing okay. because bill pay has a whole bunch of different things, right? Or maybe setting change up. change email address. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. Because bill pay has setting up payees and changing payees, you know. You guys are good. See, planning for an agile project when you focus on deliverables actually is a lot simpler and you can plan in a couple hours a whole project and then size it out if you knew how much you could get done. I think for this one, what we said was, and you guys are right on what I thought and Jerry thought, Customer enters personal information. I just had everything, email address, phone, stuff like that. Customer selects, answers security questions. The bank creates, because the bank itself is gonna have customer account, like product offers based on different aspects and they'll create that password reset and tax form. So a lot of the social security, social security number stuff. So basically what you're, what you're doing is breaking it down into things that you can think of and prioritize and then when you know what ones you're going to do in your first release or your next quarter, you can, when you are ready to write stories, you can further break those down into one or more stories. So components could be, are definitely usually larger than a story. So I hope that helped illustrate. Now it's, now it's time to define an MVP. We're not going to do it for the banking app because that would take too long, but you'll hear the term minimum viable product. You'll also hear the term minimum marketable feature set or minimum business increment. Basically, it's like if you're going to release something, what's the smallest group of functionality that has meaning for your customers? So I'm going to do the get ready for work example. If, I, if you've already done this before, then I hope you don't have your patience. But this is was when I when somebody did this with me eight years ago, it really, really helped me identify in my head and solidify in my thoughts what the minimum viable product is. So here's our get ready for work example. So what I'm going to ask Aubrey to do and for you to do is to list and I'll try to put them in order the best I can. But I want like 10 things that you do in the morning when you to get ready for work. So let's start with the alarm. So let's say your alarm rings or whatever. So what happens between then and you walk out 
the door? Uh, shower. Okay. Uh, feed the dog. Brush oh, your teeth. Brush your teeth. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Get dressed. That would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I have co coffee and eat breakfast. I'm going to separate those out because not everybody eats breakfast. Okay. Um, check status of public transportation. That's important in the DC Metro for sure. Okay. Make your lunch. Nobody has kids. They got to get up or they're on their own. <laughs> Pack your bag or purse. Okay. Okay. One more. Uh, check check weather and traffic. Oh, we finally got a kids. So we got to ki get kids ready for school or daycare. So that's up with it. All right. So we have just in general shower, brush your teeth, get dressed. Have some coffee, maybe eat breakfast, feed the dog, get your kids ready, make your lunch, pack your bag, check your status, whatever. So this could be, these are all your requirements. So if you were spending, so think about this. So if you're spending three months doing the requirements for your get ready for work application, it would have to support all of these things because if you're going to do the full blown application. So in traditional project management, you would definitely identify all of this. So let's pretend that you missed your alarm. The alarm didn't ring. You set it for PM instead of AM. <laughs> How many times have you ever done that, right? So the alarm, I'm going to try to find straight, did not ring. You have 10 minutes to get out of the shower. I mean, to get out of, <laughs> but maybe you won't take a shower. You have 10 minutes to get out of the house. What is it? that you are not going to do when you realize that you're late. Eat breakfast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you're, probably make, not gonna time you're probably not going to eat lunch. You're probably not going to eat breakfast. Not going to make not lunch. Gonna... No coffee, no shower. Well, I don't know about the coffee, but I'll do. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can drive. I'm glad you're brushing your teeth and getting dressed. Is the dog going to starve? The kids probably you got to get them out of the house. You probably are going to check the weather. You're just going for it, dude, because you got to get out of here. Probably, I would guess. And do you need to check the status of public transportation? Or are you driving today? I don't know. So you got or Uber. I got an Uber. Huh? I got an Uber. Uber. There you go. So the bottom line is, the minimum viable product is a lot different than the full and complete application. And when somebody took our team through this exercise, it really was an aha moment for me. So when people talk, so like if you're gonna write an app to help, I mean, really, you're not, you're only gonna focus on brushing your teeth and getting dressed, making sure that your animals and your, your furry kids and your human kids get ready. You're gonna pack your bag. You're probably not gonna check the status. You're just gonna get, do whatever you need to do to get out the door. And that is the exercise, like when you, are looking at your minimum viable product. So once you've broken down your high level epics into your deliverable components, no, this exercise helps you identify what the highest priority components are going to be. So that's when you create a release plan. So you say, okay, what do I think? Because you don't know what in Scrum we call your velocity is how much you can get done every two weeks. So you're just going to have to go with your gut feel. So you're going to organize all the components based on priority. 
into releases. And now you have a plan. Is that so much easier? I mean, when I, when we realized this, no one taught us this. This was something that we just sort of came, came into from years and years of, I think I took a class and somebody kind of talked a little bit about this, but the bottom line is that it doesn't take six weeks to create a plan. You can do this in less than an afternoon if you're starting a project and you really, it really is powerful. Right, and, and one thing, Cindy, that I want to point out is that when go back to that previous slide, if you would, please. Sure. The, these, little, these little things here, um, these can be written on sticky notes I, and you can right. just put sticky notes up on the wall. I mean, this it's so simple and it, it, it's just a very easy way to plan. I, I really I love it. Yeah, I, I've done it using Visio. Like I've done this with remote teams using Visio where we just make little colored boxes, one for each epic, and have people like really talk about what they need to get done. And eventually looking at this, when, when you list these out, when you know what your velocities, you would go back and add sizes, story points to these and figure out if you actually can meet your commitment. So to summarize, how do you plan for an agile release? You're going to group your high value components that should be delivered together. That's another thing. Like some things just make sense, even if they're not part of the MVP, that they should be delivered together. You'll start with the components, of the MVP for your earliest release. You're going to prioritize all that for delivery. You're going to put pick dates that deliver on a regular and fre frequent basis. You're going to as you start doing this, you know, after you get through your first quarter or your first release, you're going to rework them so the team feels comfortable with the release dates. And I learned this at Nike, who is like the marketing magician of the world. Even if you're doing continuous delivery to production, which means you press a button like Facebook does and it goes straight out, you still track completion of your components that you said you would get done by your release dates because it's a really good marketing thing. Did we walk our talk? Is Scrum working? If you get everything done and more that you thought you could at the beginning of your project, that's a really powerful message to send. And then you just don't keep this release, like release two, based on release one, in the second quarter, you may change the component. So we're agile, you're constantly replanning releases every quarter based on customer feedback. Okay, so once you've identified, you know what you're going to write for your, what you need to build for your first release, then you go to yourself, oh my gosh, I mean, you'll see some frameworks that want you to write like a whole quarter's worth of stories. Please, please don't because you'll just, you can change your mind after you start writing things. So because you already have a plan, you know what you need to build. So focus on the near term. Do not wait to start sprinting. I mean, within the first, after the first week of your project kicked off, I want you to be sprinting. So write the stories with requirements and acceptance criteria for your first two sprints. If you're gonna size stories based on level of effort, you will, if you come next week, we'll talk to you about how to transition from hours into story points. But please, story points are not ours, and they don't have the same value across the teams. And for this intro, just know that story points are sized in something relative called story points. And then you're going to sprint. The difference between Agile Scrum and traditional project management is you spend minimal time exploring. When I was at a company, and I'm not going to name it, you could explore for three to four months before you did anything. It's a complete, you're, it's all conjecture. If there's a lot of churn and a lot of arguing, but if you started doing within two weeks of project initiation, then the conjecture and the arguing is lessened because it's all based on reality. And you wanna get your customer feedback as soon as possible. So now we're gonna talk about, I've written some stories. I, I brought them into my sprint. People talk about stand up and sprinting, but what does that mean? Stand up itself is something that has to happen every day because you need to keep your eyes on the prize. Stand up is a 10 to 15 minute daily meeting. 
if you're all together, everyone should literally be standing up or you should be practicing the intent and you should keep it for 10 to 15 minutes. It should happen at the same time each day. So people can't say they didn't know when it was. All attendance is mandatory. You need to focus on closing the stories that you brought into the sprint because closed stories are the only stories that you can release. And actually, when you get into it, closed stories are the only stories that count. In Scrum, stories are either 0% complete or 100% complete. When you realize that, getting stuff done becomes a super priority. You're going to start with the first and highest priority active story, and you're going to move down the list. And you're going to, when you look it up, they'll tell you you need to ask three questions. Did you accomplish what you intended to yesterday? What are you planning to do for me today? And do you have any blockers? And when GSD does some training, or if I come in and help you, I'm also going to ask you when that story is going to close, because I need to know if you need help. The whole team is responsible, not just the person reporting on status. That's another thing. And all other discussion gets tabled or meetings get decided or people decide they're going to meet after. But it's really important for stand up to be a consistent and pleasant experience for everybody. I used to tell people it was the best 10 minutes of their day because then they know what to focus on for the rest of the day. That if you keep to the idea and the essence of stand up, it will be the most important thing that you do every day. In Scrum, you'll hear something called a burn down chart. So you track sprint status, oh, another type of via a burn down chart. A burn down chart is basically a graphical representation of closed stories. So along the left the axis, it tells you the number of story points brought into the sprint. So you'll see that we brought in probably 45 story points in this. Across the bottom are the number of days in the sprint. And those straight lines, like if you do sprint planning on Friday in the slightly grayed areas, those are the weekends. So if sprints are 10 days and you plan on Friday so you can jump out of the gate on Monday, it's not really fair to count the weekends. But this is in JIRA, and JIRA loves to show you the weekends. So story points have to burn down to zero as they close. And you should be at zero by the end of the sprint, which means you've met your sprint commitment. So if you're looking at the red line, which is the actual, because story points are not in fractions and you don't burn down until the story is closed, there'll always be some sort of step down. And here is an example. No one ever gives you an idea about like how you spend your two weeks. So let's say you do your sprint planning. A lot of times on day 10, at the end of a sprint, I'll do the, the, re the team demos, the retrospective, and at the end do planning. So I get a lot done in two hours because it, you should be 100% ready and prepared. So starting with day one, you should have your planning ready. You should know what you're going to be working on. You should be bringing your stories in. If you are the team demo is different from the customer demo. So if you are team demoing, that's a more technical demonstration of what was accomplished in the last sprint and maybe some how to's. And it's really focused on learning for the team. The customer demo is showing people, getting them up to speed, because if they're going to start using it in a pre-production environment, then they need a demo. They need to understand what they're going to be using, because maybe the, the people who are going to be using it are not the people who actually tested it. So customer demos should always happen. It's also good PR. And then the rest of the first week, even though you should always be focusing on closing stories, is really the dev team wants to get a lot of stuff done right out of the gate. The product owner is going to start really thinking about what they want to do in the next sprint and adding additional stories, building their backlog while the team is closing stories. There's something called the Scrum of Scrums. If you're doing a big project or program that goes across multiple Scrum teams in between the sprint planning, the Monday of the, of the beginning of the second week, you'll want to assess where you are and what you've promised to get done, what stories you promised to get done for another team, and what other stories you need another team to finish. You're going to get ready to prioritize your backlog. I like to groom stories. 
at least two days, be, about two days before you're actually going to do sprint planning to make sure everybody understands them. They can be properly sized. And if you have a lot of churn and you may and you have end up having a ton of storage, you may want to review with your product owner and maybe your technical lead your stories and get what you're taking into sprint planning under control. Because you, if you're only going to do 45 stories in a sprint, you don't want to bring in 100 stories and try to figure out with the product owner what are the best ones. You want to have that done in advance and then you're back down to the same. So I hope this helps because people don't really tell you what you should be doing in over the two weeks. And another thing, when you're ready to move that into production, moving to production is actually a separate and independent experience that is outside of Scrum. So at some point when you are going to move your stories and stuff into production, you may be doing it at the same time that you're sprinting. So you'll have to figure out how you're going to do that along with keep continuously getting stories implemented. Okay, so I think you probably know some of these things, but I'm going to outline what I feel the benefits are. I know I've, I've talked about them a lot, but as you can see, focusing on deliverables and completed features gives you the potential to deliver something new or to fix things that are broken after every sprint. The story describes your features in terms of your completed requirement and acceptance criteria, so you know what needs to be done from a functional standpoint. And when the story is closed and accepted, it's ready to go. With the mower that you can release, then you have more ability to pivot, which reduces your risk. So if you deliver, I mean, this is with anything. If you start doing phased implementations, the more often you can deliver and customers can use your app, they can request changes and you can pivot if you're doing not going in the right direction. Miscommunication and missed requirements can be corrected with less impact. I, I think that is very powerful. And the wonderful thing about Scrum is that the product owner or the customer themselves play a more active role. They are the ones that become an integral part of the team with more influence. They learn and they how to have and accept more responsibility. And they also have more satisfaction in general because they've prioritized with you what's, what's going to be done. They approve things and accept what goes into production. And they're the ones that are responsible for prioritizing and writing the stories in a clear and concise manner. So it's, it's really where the, the role and responsibility should be. And with that, I thank you. For more information, you can go out to our site. It's gsd.guru, gsd.guru. We have information about our products. We have the first six chapters of the GSD Scrum Handbook online. You can purchase it if you want. You can also, we have a lot of blog posts about a lot of different topics. And if you're new to Scrum, you can also like, we have a lot of topics about transitioning to Scrum and how you should do that. So I think there's a lot of valuable information that can help you. If you want a copy of this slideshow, you can email me at Cynthia K at gsd.guru or Jerry at Jerry G at gsd.guru. If you have any questions, we still have nine minutes of valuable time with Jerry and myself. Yes, thank you so much, Cynthia and Jerry. Um, like like Cynthia mentioned, um, we'll go ahead and take some time for questions um, here at the end. As a reminder, if you do have a question, please be sure to type your questions into the question box that is located on the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we do have a question that uh, popped in. Um, we have an individual, Mary, is looking for some information concerning batch mainframe. Well, I mean, the, the process and the method is the same regardless of what the platform is. So if you're doing batch mainframe, you would still figure out what it is that you need to deliver and, and try to get it down to the smallest piece of functionality that you can. So you don't do an entire batch application or maybe, for instance, it's been years since I've done mainframe but like with services for instance if you're sending things across you're creating files and you want to 
make sure everything's working. A lot of times you can stub out a file that you're exporting so you don't, and then figure out what the minimum stuff is. Like when I did it at Nike, we just sent a product ID through a service, a new service architecture and got back the description. So you have to start thinking, and we'll talk about this, like if I, in, I think next week, Jerry, do we talk about iterative versus incremental development and trying to, when we try to talk about slices rather than layers, if not. I believe so, yes. Okay, if not, email me, but in general, you actually you can Google it yourself. I didn't invent it. If you look up Mona Lisa incremental versus iterative, it, it kind of gives you that whole. Absolutely. Idea. Yeah, that is, that is in the slideshow next week. You're right. You're right. Awesome. So we'll, I'll talk about it. So please come next week. But in general, the concepts and the principles don't change. It is independent of platform. Did the, I hope that helped, but I don't think because you're still on a mainframe, that doesn't mean you can't be agile. That's what I'm saying. Great. So I hope that answers uh, your question, Mary. We have a question from David. Um, in non-SW dev environment, delivering partial products may not be acceptable, but can the delivery be internal? Yes. I mean, a lot of times, well, there's two things I think you need to figure out. What do you mean by a partial product? Every story has to be able to be delivered, even if it's a small piece of functionality. So it's still a service if you send an ID and get back a description. You So you could move that into a pre-production environment and then add to it. So you need to think about sketching out and figuring out what you need, the minimum thing that you need to do to prove your concept and then add, add to it. So I understand that if you're in a so if you're like doing a SaaS product that people are using online that you may not want to deliver at the end of every sprint, but you should put them into pre-production and make sure that other people, maybe your alpha customers or your some other team, business team is looking and making sure that what you delivered is what they expected. Because a lot of times, as you know, that isn't so. So I definitely am an advocate of pre-production. When I was at Nike and we were like, for instance, putting together a new store for Japan. It was all in Japanese. We definitely had a whole store that was behind the firewall. So it didn't go into production until we launched the store, but there was a lot of stuff going on in the pre-production environment and people who knew Japanese were verifying that everything was working because we had no idea, right? We were just, <laughs> we didn't know if the trap, we couldn't read Japanese. So. Um, so, I hope that that helps. Yeah, yeah, so David just followed up and um, said it was a medical device that cannot be partially delivered. So I don't know if that. Well, you would still yeah. have some version of it that people could use the, pe the features that were complete and make sure that you're on the right track. I still think that you, I mean, I understand it's a lot different with it if you're building something, but I think you, you, you kind of need to figure out then what your features are and what the components of those are and, and deliver them in such a way that you could put them so somebody can use it and make sure you're on the right track before you've completely finished the product. And I mean, that, that takes some creativity. And as a developer and engineer, it's not your responsibility. That's why it's really important to have a product owner or somebody who has their pulse in the business so that they can help you define that. I mean, sometimes the technical people feel like, oh, I can't do that. But the business people, they, they think a little differently. You need that guidance. And I think, I think Cynthia, you know, perhaps if, you know, when you've been in the hospital, uh, and this is a very simple medical device that, you know, I'm not sure how complex the one you're speaking of is. But if you uh, are in the hospital, you go to the doctor's office and they take your temperature, your, your pulse and your blood pressure. If you were going to build a machine like that, you could start with just the pulse monitor, perhaps, or you could start with just the blood pressure piece and break it down into slices of functionality and then pull it all together into your final product. I think that might be a way to approach it. Does that sound reasonable, Cynthia? Yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole point is, and of course, every situation is different, but you have to break the thought process that I have to go through all the requirements, I have to build it all, I have to test it all before I can release it. I'm going to give you a really good idea. It's not medical devices, but the reason that the iPad was, even though it wasn't technically as good as some of the Microsoft type devices, is because they released it 
and it had the same stuff as a phone. It didn't have the word. It didn't have the other. It didn't have everything they wanted, but they got it out on the market and they got people used to using them and excited about using them. They, Steve Jobs or whoever did that, he understood, they understood what a minimum viable product was. They put something out that was not exactly what they're doing. I mean, the Microsoft Surface, which is more like a, a laptop, is kind of probably what eventually they wanted to go to, but when they released it, it was just like a big fall. Great. So um, Mary has a question about um, sending the invitation for next week's uh, webinar. So yes, Mary, just to answer your question, there is um, a second part um, to the webinar next week. It's a little bit more of a deeper dive into writing agile stories. And I can absolutely um, send that link to register um, in the follow-up email that will be going out this evening. Um, so if you're interested, please sign up. Um, and and this will be an extension of what was covered today and a little bit deeper of a, a dive and discussion. Um, Lucius has a question about, um, it seems like there's not much difference in agile and traditional PM. Um, I guess how much of this experience change, how much of this experience changes in the role of product owner or the customer? The customer is not, well, A, I think it is a lot different being a project manager and a scrum master because your focus is different because you have to give up some of that control. And a lot of us are control freaks who used to be project managers. And with the business, it's like the business is used to blaming the technical teams because stuff didn't get done. But now that they're the ones prioritizing it, they're the ones that are defining the requirements, they're the ones that are approving things. That shift and that level of responsibility is really, sometimes it is not so easy to get people to accept that because it, it is a great and grave responsibility and then they, you know, to, to become a product owner. Right. They're not necessarily the product manager, but they're translating all that, those plans into new, new functionality. So I think you just have to start one team at a time, like get a team that's put together for whatever, in whatever area that you think that the business really wants to accept that responsibility and prove and help prove how that works because I don't agree that everything needs to go agile all at once. I think you kind of, each team needs to work it out, but I think you also need some success under your belt or else people will tell you agile doesn't work, but it usually doesn't work because you don't understand it or you're not practicing it like the product owner doesn't have or accept the, the grave responsibility that they need to, to make it work, including time. It's, it's a daily commitment for people. Perfect. Okay. Well, it looks like we've covered all of our questions and we are right now at the one o'clock on the dot uh, time frame. Ladies, is there anything else you want to cover before we wrap up here? No, just email us if, or, you know, get in touch with us if you have any other questions. And I definitely, since you guys are new, I would definitely go out to the website and, and, and check it out and, and especially look at the blog and search through some of that because it, it'll be very helpful for you, I think. Because we we glossed over this in 45 minutes. There's no way you're going to know Scrum by then. <laughs> in a day, maybe. <laughs> Scrum in a day, maybe. <laughs> in an hour. Yes. Well, and of course, <laughs> I, have, I always have to add, go Terps. Yes. Well, thank Yay. you. Thank you both so much for, um, for sharing all this information with us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, yes, have a wonderful you. day. And as Jerry said, go Terps. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody.